good evening, uh, viewers from across Africa. Um, um, this is your program, The Law in Africa. Thank you for joining us this evening. I am your humble host, Mohamed Uiba, president of the Law Society, Prabe College, University of Sierra Leone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, of course, as we say in our local balance, kushe, kushe. And to our brothers and sisters from Eastern Africa, we say Karibu, and um, for us um, in the South, we say Tumela, and to our brothers from the North, we say um, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi Ta'ala wa Barakatuh. Welcome to the program, The Law in Africa. Today, if God wills, we shall be looking at um, the legal system of the Republic of Ghana. Of course, um, we've got so many things from Ghana. We've um, we've got their culture shared um, with us through their movies and music, and of course um, through um, activism and Pan Africanism. The Sajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, as we we are introduced to him um, in our study of history, um, showed us the beautiful side of Ghana and how Ghana um, helped in shaping or rather the involvement of um, getting an independent Africa as um, we all now in our different um, countries have independence and we do celebrate uh, Independence Day. Um, um, to help us explore and um, discover the legal system of the Republic of Ghana, I am joined by no lesser person but um, the president of the Law Students Union of um, the University of Cape Coast. I stand to be guided. Is it Cape Coast or... Yeah, okay, good. Exactly. Um, the University Mr. Of Felix Hassan. Mr. Felix Hassan, you are highly welcome to the law in Africa. Thank you, my brother Mohammed. It's a pleasure to honor your invitation. Thank you. Um, as always, viewers don't mind my angle. Um, I go, I'm going to be looking at this point because the monitor is right in front of me and the camera is um, here. So don't mind the way I look or rather the way I turn my um, angle. Um, today, as I've said earlier on, we are going to um, the Gold Coast, as it used to be known, and we shall be exploring the legal system of the Republic of Ghana. As always in this program, we are guided by the definition of Professor Adolphus Leonos Hart um, of the legal system. We shall be looking at the system of laws, we shall be looking at the institutions, and then we are also we're going to be looking at um, the different um, um, players and stakeholders of the legal system. Um, to start with, Mr. Felix, um, first of all, I, I always like to ask my colleague, President, how, how, how is it? First of all, um, I heard of the, that you guys finished um, and you graduated from the, the, the university um, sometime, I think, last week. Um, on behalf of the Law Society of Private College, and I think on behalf of um, even though I'm not constitutionally mandated to say this, but on behalf of the entire Sierra Leone, would love to um, um, express our sincerest congratulations to you guys for finishing the LSE. Um, and of course, we are going to celebrate um, your birthday again. I know that uh, you shall be celebrating your birthday tomorrow by the will of God. Congratulations, sir. Thank you very much, my brother. Uh, it's yes. Your information is uh, partly bright in the sense that we finished our last papers as far as our LLB is concerned. However, uh, due to the COVID, I mean, we've still not really graduated. And a normal circumstance where you receive your certificate is where you actually graduate. But, you know, this uh, new pandemic has uh, altered a whole lot for all of us across the globe. So. Uh, Yes, thank you for the congratulatory message. We receive it duly, uh, but we are still yet to uh, receive our certificates. I but anyways. Okay. Um, for you to be part of this program, um, you can join us via Facebook. You can comment on the, the Facebook Live page as we are streaming live now from our um, humble homes. And then um, you can ask um, any question with regards to the topic today, with regards to um, the legal system of uh, the Republic of Ghana. Of course, um, in this program, we've been to the south, uh, we've been to uh, Botswana, we've been to the east, uh, we've been to Kenya, and of course the west, um, we've been to Nigeria, and today we are looking at the land of 
Dr. Kwani Nkrumah. Um, Mr. Felix Hassan, so firstly, take us through um, the system of laws that we have in Ghana. For example, now in Sierra Leone, we do practice the English common law and the doctrines of equity. And then we also um, do practice our customary laws um, in um, specific um, communities within the jurisdiction of Sierra Leone. And also, um, we do have um, laws from Parliament and then the Constitution of Sierra Leone, Act Number 6 of 1991. Can we... Um, learn from you, educate us um, through, um, um, sorry, educate us um, with the system of laws that we have in Ghana. Okay, so um, I must say that when it comes to the legal system of Ghana, uh, we share so many similarities with the legal system of Sierra Leone in the sense that your article 170, close one, is similar to our Article 11, 1 of our 1992 Constitution, where we have the Constitution as the primus inter pares, or the supreme law of the land, uh, from which all laws draw their validity. And followed by that is the Act of Parliament, then uh, subsidiary legislation. Of course, we have existing laws, and then the common law. But uh, to still structure my answer to fit the question and the example you gave me. Uh, we also practice uh, from the English common law that we inherited from our colonial masters, uh, which are the British. So we also practice the, the common law system. Okay, that's good. Um, um, it is interesting for me your submission that um, um, you um, created um, the system of um, the system in Ghana to that of our um, legal structure here, first one to section 170, subsection one of our constitution. And then um, my, my, my question has always been, why as Africans, to start with, um, don't mind this question because I'm kind of Pan-Africanist. Why as Africans, we do prioritize the laws we, um, we inherited from our colonial masters and see our laws, our customary laws, as barbaric and they must, um, they must, be, con they must be in consonance with, um, with the laws um, of, um, of, of mm -hmm. kind of de defined as natural justice. Um, and um, if you look at that definition, you'll see that if our laws are not in consonance with the laws we inherited from the colonial masters, then obviously we do not have good laws. Why, why is it so from your own perspective? I think that to, to trace this, uh, the answer to this question, we, we have to trace it back to the historical and uh, the legal significance of uh, our common law system, our, our legal system. So uh, if, if you take the legal system of Ghana, for example, uh, it can be traced back to what is commonly known as the Bond of 1844, which was signed by a confederation of panty chiefs uh, with the British. And uh, this was done by Commander Hill and uh, of course, George McLean in 1884. But before the community force of the bond, uh, McLean as a governor was exercising ultra virus jurisdiction uh, within the forts and castles on the coast and the areas that were closer to the forts and castles. And so, uh, in a report that was submitted to the House of Commons, uh, predating the bond of 1844, uh, Dr. D.D. D. Claridge, of course, made mention of the irregularity of the jurisdiction that McLean was exercising at the Gold Coast. And so the House of Commons, after uh, their investigation, saw that yes, it was true, and they brought in Commander Hill, who was to become the commander, uh, who was to become the governor of the Gold Coast. And of course, George McLean, who was a merchant, was now moved to the position of a judicial assessor. And so right after the signing of the bond, uh, if you consider the provisions of that bond, you can somewhat link it to the Magna Carta of uh, England, where the king was brought under the law. Before the bond of 1844, there was no legal document that actually restricted the chiefs from uh, exercising their legislative, uh, executive, and judicial powers. 
So the bond is the first document that actually took away the powers over life, power over property and criminal procedure from the chiefs and subject, submitted them to the British uh, common law. So it was practiced from the castles. And uh, from then we got uh, the latter laws that followed up to our independence and even post-independence and here we are. But to still do justice to your question, I think that it comes down to what Dr. Kwame Nkrumah said about neocolonialism. Uh, I believe that it's unfortunate that the umbilical courts of the colonized countries in Africa are still not fully cut. And so even though Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso and Togo are neighbors to Ghana, uh, you can clearly see that as far as our laws are concerned, we identify more with Nigeria, with Liberia and with Sierra Leone. And so, so far as the mental or the, I will, pardon my word, but I'll say the spiritual connection is still not cut with the colonial masters. So far as Francophone countries will not see uh, African, fellow African countries who are Lusophones or Anglophones as brothers and sisters, but will be, I mean, will be comfortable in Paris. Uh, this, this is still going to continue. And uh, until maybe as young men and women who are coming up, uh, if we don't take take these things on, we may also follow suit. So uh, that is that is my take on this question. Yeah, Jeff, uh, um, you you've said so many things that um, gladdens my heart to say the least. Because um, um, I have traveled by road from Sierra Leone to Guinea, and I've seen <laughs> I've seen I've seen exactly what you are trying to bring out. Um, um, you know, you can tell from the settings of things that uh, we are still under these people. We are, we are still not um, um, independent people. Because when you get to Guinea, when you, when you, um, you leave um, the borders of Sierra Leone, you, you will enter into a place that is quite totally different. Structurally, um, um, structurized, and then as well as um, 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 culturalized. You will see the difference. But you will ask yourself the question, Aren't we the same people? For example, I am a fuller by tribe, and most of my relatives are Guineans, and they are, they are, um, they are, um, in fact, my brother is a Guinean. My, 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 my half brother is okay. a Guinean. And, and they are, they've, they've lived in Guinea for quite a long time. But when we converge, when we come together, you'll see the difference. You'll see my, my, my own culture, the way I do things, and the way I, I practice my, my own system of laws, if I will say. You, you know, that, that's exactly what you are saying. So, um, 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 like you said, um, um, one, one similarity you mentioned um, with, the, with the bond um, that was enacted, or rather established, um, during the, um, uh, um, is, it, is it 18? Can I, can I get 18, the date again? Yeah, 1844. Yeah, 1844. It's quite similar to the treaties that we've been taught in history um, of um, the Treaty of Naivana and the Treaty of King Kong. When do I, when do I, when the white man came, they, they, they had to do this treaty with um, the customary um, um, kings and queens they met. And, <laughs> but um, it, it can be argued that um, as far as uh, the principle, even the principle of contract law in the English, um, 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 in the English point of view, it can be argued that that treaty was not, um, uh, was not a valid treaty because in, 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 as we've been taught in the principle of contract law, the, it has to be consensus ad idem, the meeting of minds. And if you look at um, um, these treaties signed by these early Europeans and our first, um, their first encounter with African um, kings and queens, you realize that there was not a meeting of minds. You understand? But however, today we are practicing the laws that was enacted in England. I, it, it, I, it, can be, it, can be, it can be a surprise to you that in Sierra Leone, we still do have um, what we call the Offences Against the Persons Act, which was enacted in the United Kingdom in 1861. We still do have that law. We have um, the Nassini Act of 1916, which was enacted in England. We still, uh, th those laws are still uh, part, and parcel, part and parcel of our laws in Sierra Leone. But anyway, that's how we are African. So now let, 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 let's take the discussion um, um, further. Um, 
now that you've mentioned um, these laws, and then you started by um, referencing the Constitution of Ghana, can we kindly go now to the Constitution of Ghana, its features and structure? Take us through um, the Constitution of Ghana. How um, or what is the guanum, as um, as Kelsen would say, of Ghana? All right, thank you for that question. Okay, so um, like I said earlier in my submission, the Constitution, the 1992 Fourth Republican Constitution, is the supreme law of the land, and all other laws draw their validity from the Constitution. All laws uh, are stated, uh, if you consider the Constitution, uh, you can see that in Article 11, which I linked to your Section 170, subsection 1, we have the hierarchy of the laws. Uh, of course, they are st stipulated there. So the Constitution, uh, the Fourth Republican Constitution, is the supreme law of the land. But before we go to the 1992 Constitution, I must say that after the bonds, uh, of course, the British came up with many ordinances, and uh, in the early 1920s and 30s, we had constitutions, like that of the Gorgesberg Constitution, we had the Barnes Constitution. Then we go to 1957, where Ghana had its independence. Uh, of course, in 1960, Ghana got its first constitution, which more or less served as the grand norm, but unfortunately, uh, there was a coup d'etat in 1966 to overthrow uh, Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. And some of the reasons that were given were that, of course, uh, he, he changed Ghana to be a one-party state. Uh, he brought in the Prevention Detention Act, Preventive Detention Act. Uh, he declared himself as a lifetime president. Uh, so coupled with so many things, of course, uh, during his absence uh, on, on, I mean, uh, presidential mission, he was overthrown by the military, and the body that overthrew him was the National Liberation Council. But of course, from 1966 to 69, they made sure that at the end of this tenure, they returned Ghana to constitutional rule. So then, in 1969, we had the Second Republican Constitution, which ushered in the Second Republic. Unfortunately, in 1972, uh, there was another coup d'etat, this time by the National Redemption Council. And I mean, there was also another pilot coup by the Supreme, Supreme Military Council. So between 1972 to 1979, we were in military regime or military rule. And uh, before 1979, I think two, two months before we returned to constitutional rule, a group of young soldiers uh, who formed what we what was termed as the Armed Forces Revolution Council also overthrew these NRCs and SMCs who were their yes their superiors. And after overthrowing them, they just returned the country to uh, constitutional rule within two months. So then we got the Third Republican Constitution, which is the 1979 Constitution. Then after two years, in 1981, on 31st December, uh, the same person who led the AFRC, who was in the person of Jerry John Rawlings, also led another coup to overthrow the third Republican government. Then from the time of 1981 to 1992, there was a military regime under the PNDC. Then in 1992, of course, uh, Ghana was returned back to constitutional rule. And we had the Fourth Republican Constitution, which is a 1992 Constitution, which serves as the mother of all laws here in Ghana. Now, after uh, the 1992 Constitution comes the Acts of Parliament, uh, or the enactment of Parliament. And then this is followed by the subsidiary legislation uh, made by persons or authorities uh, as conferred on them by Parliament or the Constitution. Then. After that, we have the existing laws, the laws that were enforced before the coming into force of the 1992 Constitution. But of course, the Constitution is specific that as far as the existing laws are concerned, they are to be modified to come into conformity with the 1992 Constitution. So where 
any existing law is found to be inconsistent with any provision of the 1992 constitution, then to the extent of that inconsistency, such provision or such law is declared void. Then after that is the fifth source of law, which is the common law. So for the Ghana, for the, or for the Ghanaian common law, it's, it starts with the English common law, but of course it has um, evolved in the sense that when you talk about the Ghanaian common law, it is made up of three components. First and foremost, the English common law as we receive them and as they are being transformed. And of course, we have the doctrines of equity and we have our customary law. So these three come together to still form what is known as the Ghanaian common law. Yes, yeah, so uh, these are the laws uh, as far as uh, Ghana is concerned or as far as our legal system is concerned. All right, great. Um, you've, um, you've mentioned um, so many similarities with, uh, with our own system here. Um, for example, um, the, the system um, um, of the, the hierarchy of the sources of law. Um, in, in, in Sierra Leone for us, um, in post one to section 1, 170 subsection 1, the constitution is the highest law, the mother of all laws, as is rightly um, um, with you guys. And also, um, you also um, said one, one other thing, the Ghanaian common law, which of course is quite similar to that of the Sierra Leonean common law as, as encapsulated in section 170 um, subsection 2, I stand to be corrected, uh, yeah, subsection 2. Um, yes, of course. Because um, the Sierra Leone common law is um, comprised um, um, the it comprises um, the, the 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 common law has been inherited and adopted from the British um, and due to colonial and historical legacies, and of course um, the doctrines of equity and then our own customary laws. Now let's go to uh, your customary law because for us our customary laws are. Uh, the jurisdiction of our customary law is kind of um, limited as it is defined in the Local Court Act of 2011. Our Local Court Act of 2011 defines the jurisdiction of the customary law that is it's only applicable to certain communities in Sierra Leone, meaning our customary laws are not applicable, for example, in the capital of Freetown. You cannot apply customary law in Freetown. Neither can we have a local court in Freetown. So take us through um, the system of your, your own customary law, the formation of your own customary law and its jurisdiction. Okay, so um, for our customary law, uh, I will still try and take it as back to the roots, but of course I will try and do justice to the question. So um, before the coming I mean, of the British, of course we, we had uh, various ethnic groups and they all had their laws and customs that governed them. Now, when the British took over and after they signed the board of 1844, of course, I must let our listeners take note of the fact that the bond of 1844 did not cover the whole of Ghana, but it covered just one third of Ghana, the southern states of Ghana, the areas that were closer to the coast. So there is this main force or there was this tribe in, in Ghana, which is still in existence, which is known as the Ashantis. Uh, they were in constant feudal wars with the other tribes of the South. And the bond of 1844 was signed so that the British would protect the Fantis from the Ashantis. So somewhere um, after the bond, there were fights or wars between the, the English and the Ashantis. And after they conquered the Ashantis, that is when they brought in the Supreme Court ordinance and uh, what is important to this question, which is known as the, um, the ju Jurisdiction Act. Um, the Catcher Act. Yes, 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 yes. Let me see. Uh, I think uh, I missed the point. Let me see. Okay. So they, they brought in what, we, what is known as the Supreme Court Ordinance. And after the Supreme Court ordinance, the Native Jurisdiction Ordinance. So the Native Jurisdiction Ordinance was that which gave the local authorities the opportunity to practice their customary law. So the chiefs and other local officers were, I mean, uh, able to practice the customary law 
side by side with the common law. But of course, the common law was superior and the local laws were not applicable to the non ghanaians So uh, the courts under this uh, Native Jurisdiction Act uh, were not able to prosecute uh, persons who were non ghanaians However, as time evolved, the native uh, courts were more or less amalgamated into the system, the common law system. And uh, of course, it is from there that uh, we get to see court, the customary law being practiced by our courts. But I think when it comes to our customary law, it's somewhat synonymous to how it's practiced in your courts, just that uh, when it comes to our capital, which is Accra, uh, it is not uh, excluded from the practicing of customary law. So for us, the customary law is, uh, these are the rule or body of laws that are applicable to different customs or different tribes. But of course, they are written, there are some that are written and there are some that are not written. For the written ones, the law is specific that they should be as determined by the superior courts of judicature. And many of these customary laws uh, have been used and have been practiced. And so uh, many of them, when it comes to the customary law, the judges or the courts take judicial notice of the customary laws. Of course, in Ghana, when it comes to customary law, is a, is a question of law, not a question of fact. So uh, that is why, of course, they take judicial notice. But when it comes to the unwritten laws, uh, the laws of Ghana are specific that uh, where these laws come up in the proceedings, the court is to stay proceedings and do an inquiry into the laws um, as far as uh, people or persons who, are, uh, who have in-depth knowledge as far as the customary laws are concerned. So the, the proceedings are staged, the court does the inquiry, then of course, um, whatever they gather, they use it to apply to the, the substantive issue before the court. So that is, that is it as far as our customary laws are concerned. So um, how, how strong or how influential um, the, Ghanaian, the Ghanaian customary law is to um, the development of the jurisprudence of Ghana? That is, that is an interesting question. All right, so, um, I mean, after I received this information, uh, in, invitation from your honorable uh, society, um, aside from my Albania legal system, I also tried to read a little bit about your legal system. And uh, it's interesting to know that I think we, we actually have uh, legal systems that are twins in, in this yes, regard. Yeah, yeah, I, I can't it was well, intertwined for well, the submission. Yeah, I've loved that. Yes. Because, yes, yes. because when it comes so to customary law, yeah. yeah, so when it, when it comes to the customary law, unfortunately, uh, I think that it's, it forms a minute aspect uh, of our laws. And I mean, it's, it has barely, I mean, affected uh, the jurisprudence of our laws. But of course, uh, I must make mention of the fact that when it comes to our laws on succession, uh, when it comes to laws on marriage, and uh, I mean, areas as such, family, uh, inheritance, with these ones, of course, uh, the Ghanaian legal system has done incredibly well to ensure that uh, these customs were not thrown away and we just embraced fully the local customs of England and that were transformed to be the common law. Uh, but however, uh, of course, the common law still prevails. So yes, it has, it has in a way made some um, contribution to the Ghanaian jurisprudence, but I will not say that it's a significant contribution. Okay. So um, what if, um, if um, let me say uh, a, a principle of customary law um, comes in conflict with, uh, let's say, um, the, 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 let me, let's say a statute as enacted by the legislature. So um, which one takes precedence? Okay, all right. So uh, based on our Article 11, one of our 1992 Constitution, um, the Act of Parliament is 
the second as far as the hierarchies are concerned, is concerned, sorry. And uh, the customary law is fifth on the hierarchy because it forms part of the common law. And so where uh, a customary law principle comes, uh, I mean, clashes with the provision in the statute, it is the provision in the statute that would definitely override the principle of customary law. What, 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 what if it is the common law? I'm just trying to, 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 um, to start an argument. <laughs> I'm listening. Yes, yeah, so what, what, if, what if it's the common law? What if the common law is in conflict? That, a, that, that, is a, a that, that is also that is an interesting one. So um, for, for our Ghanaian laws, I must say that uh, of course we inherited uh, all, almost all the laws from England, but you can see that the legislation over the years and even the military regimes also contributed to the development of our laws. Uh, and you can see that many of the laws or the acts of England, we have their similar acts uh, which are which have been enacted with the Ghanaian society at heart. So you can see some modifications. Some two are just a replica of the act in England. So uh, with our common law, when when principles of common law uh, clash with customary law, uh, your question is which one precedes. Uh, one thing with our one thing with our courts is that when it comes to uh, customary law or certain aspects of uh, litigation that are covered by customary law, it all depends on the law which you come to the court under. So, for example, uh, let's say in thoughts, uh, when it comes to the common law, slander is not actionable per se. But when it comes to our customary law, slander is actionable per se. So, if you if you come under the common law, then you would, I mean, have to uh, go beyond uh, just proving that. But when it comes to, uh, if you come under the customary law, then if it is established that the defendant slandered you, of course, uh, in the absence of further reasonable doubts that will be raised by the defendant, I think that the court would deem it actionable per se and whatever necessary remedies uh, that are available, definitely we will see them. So it all depends on what you come under, whether the customer or common law. Okay. Um, Viers, um, if you are just joining us, um, today we are with um, our big brother, Mr. Felix Hassan, the president of the Law Student Union University of Cape Coast, Ghana. And uh, we are exploring the legal system of Ghana. And uh, believe you me, we've learned a lot. And, um, I have learned a lot and we've discovered that there are so many similarities between um, the legal system of Ghana and that of our own legal system here in Australia. And um, there, was, there was a time when these countries were, were under the same administration. I know, I know um, history has, of course, uh, told us that, that there was this time when the administration of the, of the Gold Coast was um, under the, the the oversight of the, that of the governor um, um, in Freetown, so you you may tell where um, these similarities are coming from. Um, um, you can be part of this program by commenting on Facebook. Uh, we, we, the, the comment that we are having is uh, Kwame Kuruma, Kwame Kuruma. <laughs> you know, when, when we talk about Ghana, uh, people will associate Ghana with. Um, Sajipo, Dr. Kwame of, of course, he, he is our father. Such a great, such a great, great um, African. Uh, um, we've, um, we've discussed, um, most of the, our discussion tonight has been based on that of um, the judiciary, because um, uh, it's kind of this the epicenter of uh, the, the country's um, legal system. But I, I want to um, take us um, a, a bit or a shift from the judiciary and to the the institution with the mandate or with the constitutional mandate to make and or make laws. For us in Sierra Leone, also to section 105 of our constitution, the 1991 constitution, it is within the jurisdiction of parliament, the Sierra Leone parliament, 
to make laws and they can delegate uh, 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 by way of delegated uh, legislation. So um, what uh, or which um, institution has that constitution mandate to make um, to make laws in Ghana? All right. Okay, thank you, my brother. So when it comes to the institution that has the constitutional mandate to enact laws for the country Ghana, uh, it is the Parliament of Ghana uh, that has the mandate to make laws for Ghana. And uh, for, like you rightly said, I think it's so similar with your, your jurisdiction in the sense that, yes, they make those laws and they can also delegate uh, for laws to be made. Now, when it comes to making of an act in Ghana, um, our laws are specific that when it comes to an act or an enactment by parliament, uh, it first starts with the publication of the bill. And then after that, uh, I mean, with the publication of the bill, it should be accompanied with the uh, explanatory memorandum. Then after that, we come to the, uh, I mean, before that is even, let me take it from the top. Uh, it should, yeah, the bill should be published 14 days in a gazette. And of course, it's introduced to Parliament together with the explanatory memorandum. Then there are the first, second, and third readings. Then after that um, is the presidential asset. So with that, the president, after assenting and putting his seat in it, uh, comes into force. Uh, but where the president refuses to assent, of course, uh, he has to give his reasons. Maybe he's he has some uh, reservations about certain provisions in the act, or maybe he's referring it to the Council of States. Now, after doing that, uh, it comes back, if he still does not assent, the laws of Ghana specific that um, Parliament, through a resolution of two-thirds of um, in Parliament, can pass the bill, and uh, it comes into effect after 30 days. So, um, basically, that is it when it comes to our act. Uh, of course, subsidiary or uh, so yeah, subsidiary legislation too uh, is also laid before Parliament. It's published in the Gazette, and it comes into force after 21 days. But when it comes to our subsidiary legislation, once it's made by an authority or a person, as conferred, as that authority is conferred on that personal authority, uh, Parliament is either to annul or allow the legislation, uh, they do not have any constitutional right to amend any subsidiary legislation. So either they are known or they are now. And that is it as far as uh, making of our laws is concerned. So um, 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 from your submission, we can conclude that it is Parliament that has the constitutional mandate to make laws in Ghana. Yeah. Okay. So um, um, I, I made um, to understand that um, with my um, last week with um, uh, Clifton, we learned that mm -hmm. in Kenya um, they they have this um, um, two um, uh, um, system of parliament just like the British and of course Nigeria uh, that practices the federal and um, for, um, for make, um, format of um, government and um, so in Ghana do we have only um, one parliament one house. Yes, uh, Ghana is a unitary state and uh, we have one parliament that makes laws uh, for Ghana. Of course, uh, a federal state was proposed, but Dr. Osage Fokwame Nkrumah relent through history uh, together with the British. Uh, they don't really accept that. And uh, from our independence, even up to now, we, we practice, uh, we have a unitary state and we have just one parliament. Um, Francis Calon is asking, um, please clarify, Your Excellency, are you saying that um, all competent courts of law in Ghana do have judicial oversight on customary laws? Oh, okay. All right. So, um, anyways, uh, thank you for the question, my brother. Uh, it's the uh, superior courts, because as I made mention earlier, when it comes to the customary law, according to Article 11, 1, and of course, when you get to Article 11, uh, clause 3 is specific that 
these are bodies of laws that uh, are recognizing certain customs and they are in accordance with what is prescribed by the superior courts of judicature. So it's, it's a preserve of the superior courts. Okay. Um, Sheikh Kumar has um, submitted that what an educative presentation from Brother Felix Hassan, President of the Law Society Union, or the Law Student Union. Thanks to you, President Law Society FDC, for engaging our colleagues from the sister states in educating us on their constitution. May this be a start for bringing us together as constituents in the legal profession, Sheikh Kuman Sayyid. Thank you, Sheikh Kuman Sayyid, for that compliment. Um, we are discussing, or rather exploring, the legal system of the Republic of Ghana. With me, of course, um, is Mr. Felix Hassan, the president of the Law Students Union, University of Cape Coast, Ghana. So um, we've um, gone through so many um, educative um, components tonight, and um, we are coming to the end of this program. But before we go, there is always this part of the program we do explore, which is um, the, the legal profession We've heard so much about Ghana lately, and uh, so I don't know if, if they are if the they are kind of a controversial and probably will get you into some trouble. We we are not, we, we do not hesitate, so we do not mind to skip that. But if you may kindly take us through um, the the legal profession in Ghana, on, or let's start with how does one become a legal practitioner in Ghana. Okay, sure. So um, for our laws, um, it, you need to first have an LLB. And um, an LLB from uh, a recognized institution. But of course, like I said earlier, our system is the common law system. So um, it's most preferably the LLB from a common law jurisdiction. Then after obtaining the LLB, if um, you obtain it in Ghana, uh, you sit for the Ghana School of Law entrance exam, which is popularly known, known in uh, the Ghanaian circles as the Makola exam, uh, because of where the school is situated in Makola in Accra. So uh, you sit for the entrance exam, and when you pass, you go on to do a two-year program uh, but before I even fed on that, I, I think I'll backtrack a bit on the LLB. For the LLB, we have faculties in various universities recognized uh, that have been given accreditation by the National Accreditation Board of Ghana. And uh, with these universities, uh, either you do a four-year program uh, or you do a degree and you go and do a three-year LLB program. So for uh, my university, for example, or my faculty, the undergrad four-year program was introduced uh, two years after I enrolled. So it was introduced, uh, I think, just last two years, in 2018, 2019 academic year. Uh, it's the same for many, I mean, other universities. So either a full degree, you come and do a three-year, or uh, where a faculty already runs an undergrad LLB program for four years, you do that. Now, after that, then you go and sit for the entrance exam to the Ghana School of Law, where you go to obtain a professional certificate uh, uh, to practice as a solicitor and barrister uh, at all in Ghana. Now, for those people who go to, uh, let's say, uh, other common law jurisdictions to go and do the professional courses, once you come back, you would write um, a different entrance exam, and you'll be admitted into the Ghana School of Law to read that what is what is known as the post call. Uh, for the post call, it used to be six months, but now it's a year. But for uh, uh, the regular um, professional um, studies, uh, used to be a year. Now it's two years in Ghana. So that is it uh, for for our professional training. Now, after that, you have to sit for the bar exam. And when you pass the bar exam, you are called, of course, to the bar. Like any other place, then you can choose to practice 
I, I, I intentionally use the word you can choose to practice because some people go into other things like politics or I mean into teaching or anything like that. It depends. Yeah, so that is an LLB to the professional training, then by exam, then after by exam, uh, if you're successful, you pass, you, you come out to practice uh, in Ghana. Okay, so um, let's say I, I am, hopefully by the end of um, September, I would have attained my LLB degree from the University of KIU. So um, is it any way for me to enroll for the bar in Ghana? If I choose to? Um, yes, yes, if, if you choose to, uh, if you choose to, yes, you can, you can apply and uh, you can, you can, but, 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 um, but, 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 from for your submission, your uh, I can hear you. Can you hear me? The line is breaking, come again, please. Can you hear me now? Okay, it's clear. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll try to get a microphone. I've got I've got a, I've got a very good camera. I'm trying now to fix the studio and get a microphone by by the will of God. Probably in subsequent programs will would have gotten a, a perfect sound system. And um, my bad. I'm very sorry for that. Kindly accept my apologies. No okay. Um. No so the, the the thing I was saying is that um we kind of have a a very similar situation here in Sierra Leone of how one can okay. become. A legal practitioner in our jurisdiction. However, the one, one thing that interests me, I hope you didn't say that, and I hope our, our, <laughs> our tutors and, and, and those at our administrators at the law school haven't had that from you. We don't have the entrance exams here. I, I think it has been proposed um, due to the huge um, number of applicants, it has been proposed for us to have the entrance exam. But for us, if you have an LLB from um, a recognized um, university, as you've said, as it is in Ghana, you can come to the law school here, the CIU Law School, and then hopefully you become a lawyer by the end of um, the time or by the end of the year, if you sit to the bar. So, um, but we don't have the, the entrance exam for the bar, which is, I, which I know will be, will be so uh, very, very hectic. Considering the competition, uh, I, yes, I, I, don't, I don't think uh, it's something that uh, you would enjoy. Uh, so I hope that uh, the general legal council in your country will try and put in place. I, 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 I don't know why I'm seeing some of my tutors yeah. following this program, and I hope they are not listening to this. Don't worry, I'll try. I'll try not to put you in trouble. Okay. Yeah, but initially, it was, it was not it was not the same. Ghana. I mean, it was like yours. Right after your LLB, you walk in to do the professional. If you had a first class, second class, upper second class, lower third class, that used to be the case. Then early two thousands, uh, they changed that. Uh, we know that uh, for so many reasons, it was due to lack of infrastructure, lack of adequate uh, finance, and what have you. But uh, this system of entrance exam has actually uh, been a source of pain and disappointment for many people uh, who have aspirations to read um, law and become practitioners in Ghana. Uh, I must say that lawyers in Ghana, uh, statistically, uh, roughly about 5,000. Um, if you compare that to the population of over 30 million people, then I believe that uh, the ratio is not then to write to home about. Uh, some of these lawyers too are into politics or into corporate, you know, so just a few people are actually practicing. So uh, as far as the students from the school, as far as the, 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 the uh, general legal counselor and all that is called, I think that uh, there are still some, some uh, friction uh, but hopefully, uh, I mean, we, we are thankful that we have a new Chief Justice in place and um, we hope that uh, this, this would improve as far as uh, getting a professional certificate is concerned. So that's why there, there is a gap in uh, representation as far as representation is concerned. There is a huge gap, you're saying. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now that we've, we've, we've spoken about uh, the legal system, its characteristics, and 
the description. But we haven't test we haven't tested um, how strong it is. We all know for democracy to thrive, for for us to have um, a good um, and solid system of democracy, the legal system must be very very strong. The courts must be so powerful. So now tell us how is it in Ghana as far as the legal system is concerned? How strong is the judiciary? Okay, so um, the the judiciary of Ghana um, has actually stood the test of time. Um, even from the Kwame Nkrumah days, from post-independence 1960 uh, up till today, uh, we have history of some judges uh, sticking to the rule of law so much so that uh, they were murdered. I mean, we, so we have the matters of justice. Uh, their statues are uh, even in front of our superior court, our Supreme Court, I must say. We celebrate them, uh, I think, in June. And um, so, yes, the judiciary has always tried its best to uphold the law in the presence of military regimes and civilian regimes. But I must say that for judiciary to be very, very strong, then they should be able to have control over their judicial functions, over their administrative functions, and of course, over their financial uh, independence. I mean, their financial independence should also be guaranteed. So when you consider the previous constitutions, uh, the judicial independence uh, was not fully guaranteed until the 1992 constitution. Of course, you can see traces of the independence in the previous constitutions that were but the 1992 constitution of the Fourth Republic of Ghana is very specific and fully guarantees the independence of the judiciary under Article 127. So when it comes to the monies uh, that are to be paid to judges as far as the uh, um, judicial service is concerned, it is taken out of the consolidated fund. And if you know, yes, parliament and the president have some um, duties to consider as far as uh, looking at their budget and all that is concerned. Right, they Felix, do not really exercise. Hello. Yes, Felix. We are we are running out of time now. Um, could you? Oh, please, okay. Yeah, okay. Could you please take us um, through um, the cost structure in Ghana, as asked by Francis Calon? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Very well. Yes. So, uh, for the cost structure. For, yeah, for the court structure, we have the Supreme Court, which is the best court. Uh, the Supreme Court exercises an original jurisdiction uh, to interpret the Constitution. It's the only court that has that mandate to interpret the Constitution. Uh, it also has supervisory jurisdiction over the courts below. I mean, the Court of Appeal, the High Court, and all the um, lower courts. Um, it has an appellate jurisdiction from the Court of Appeal and from the Judicial Committee of the Chieftaincy uh, of, of the National House of Chiefs. So that is the, the APS Court, then followed by the Court of Appeal, which does not have an original jurisdiction, but has an appellate jurisdiction from the Circuit Court and the High Court. Then we have the um, the High Court, uh, which has both civil and criminal jurisdictions, uh, it has an appellate jurisdiction from the district court and has a criminal appellate jurisdiction from the circuit court. Uh, when it comes to uh, the High Court, it also is the court that people can go to seek redress for violations of human rights as guaranteed under Article 33 of our 1992 constitution. Then we have the district court, which comes directly uh, below the high court. So the Supreme Court, Court of Appeal and High Court are the superior court, and the district court, the circuit court, uh, the juvenile court, which is somewhat uh, constituted in the district court, uh, are the lower courts in Ghana. Of course, when it comes to matters on chieftaincy, it is trialed by the Judicial Committee of the House of Chiefs. And like I said earlier, it is the Supreme Court that has the final appellate jurisdiction from the judicial committees of the House of Chiefs. So when it comes to the core structure, uh, that is what I've actually laid down. There are the tribunals, but of course, they are not in function like uh, they used to, even though they are guaranteed under the Constitution. Okay.
I run fast in this, so I don't know if you were able to uh, get me. I, yeah, I was a bit fast. We, we had it very clearly. Yes. Okay. We can hear you. We can hear you loud and clear, sir. Um, no. um, um Sheikh Kumans from Sierra Leone is asking: Are your jewels paid in Ghana? Are jewels paid in Ghana? Do we pay our jewels? Jewelry, uh, jewelry. Uh, I think so. <laughs> Uh, for 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 this one, I think it, it has escaped me a bit, but I think so. I think so. Okay. This well, this this is one question that I cannot really. It's not anticipate. Uh, uh, but I, I yeah. mm, yes yes yes. Uh, I think it has escaped me. This is this is first year the one hundred. I mean first week study law, so I think it has escaped me a bit. But yeah, I think so. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. All right. What about what about what about Sierra Leone? Are they paid? Well, me too. Uh, the question was asked by Shekumans. I am not sure. <laughs> I am not sure if they are paid. Yeah, uh, uh, it has never so... crossed my mind about um, the, yeah. the financial obligation or other. How do how do we maybe maybe to... they may receive some some form allowance. Of, uh, yeah. allowance, but I don't think they are really on the payroll of uh, the judicial uh, the judiciary. Okay. So maybe some form of allowance. Yeah. Okay. Um, so be before we go, can kindly before we go briefly, we are we barely have a two we barely have two minutes now. But before we go, kindly um, um take take us through an examination of um the of human rights in, in, in Ghana. We know um they, they are they are these are rights that are protected by the constitution of Ghana, but in reality, yeah. take us through um, the human rights in Ghana, especially I am always concerned with the economic and um, um social economic and cultural aspects, which um, in Sierra Leone, it is not justiciable. You cannot bring an action against the government of Sierra Leone for failing to provide socio-economic and cultural rights to you. But um, uh, that is possible to section 14 of our constitution. However, take us to probably it's different in Ghana. But what we've seen so far, I must confess, is that Ghana and Sierra Leone, as far as the legal system is concerned, are twins, as you've said in the, uh, okay. in the beginning of this program. Very well, and it, it will interest you to know that uh, the answer to this question even proves further that the two legal systems are actually twins because they are also non justiciable uh, in uh, Ghanaian laws as well, even though they are adequately provided for in Chapter 6 of our 1992 Constitution. But when it comes to fundamental human rights, which are guaranteed in Chapter 5, of course, uh, the courts do their best to make sure that. Uh, uh, they enforce uh, the the fundamental human rights, but as far as the social uh, uh, social economic rights are concerned, um, they they are also non justiciable. So, as and when the government has the means to enforce these ones, then they do so. Unfortunately, you wait for campaign promises and what have you. Uh, thanks. Uh, you've been uh, a good educator tonight. You dedicated us a lot about the legal system of Ghana it's and of not, course we've explored plan, we've explored your legal system and we've seen that um, we can live here and go to Ghana and be exactly we yes. can because we can also come to Sierra Leone and practice yeah, we can we can change the, the, these two countries <laughs> are our brothers and sisters uh, bro sister exactly. countries because we, we share exactly. similar customs and um, similar um, um, systems of laws so, uh, thank yeah. you very much. Um, um, but uh, but we, we, we practice our customary laws in our capital, unlike what you told me as far as Freetown is concerned. Yeah. I think okay. that, that may be just that, a, that's a, 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 that's a divergence. Yeah. So, uh, um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Baham of the entire law society. We have lost it's been a pleasure. Our sincere gratitude to you for coming and accepting our invitation. And we hope to have you back as soon as possible. Man. And I, I, quite, yeah, I quite remember you in Gaborone last year. I think it's exactly one year ago. Uh, but, it's um, exactly one year ago, yeah, yes. We, we, we partied a lot. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> my brother. <laughs> yeah. you know, we, we, the day we, we went to Center Town, the day the results were announced, when uh, this, uh, this yes, guy Uganda yeah. won, won the competition. Uh, yes. Great, yeah, it was a great time. Yes, yeah. I, I so much remember. I remember. So thank you very much, my brother. I hope to see you soon one day in person. I know we could have met in, in Washington had it not been for 
Yeah, COVID. Uh, yeah, COVID, unfortunately. unfortunately uh, but I mean, that, that's that much was cancelled. We could have seen each other again. Yeah. But probably, maybe, 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 yeah. maybe after COVID, uh, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll catch up again. You know? Yeah, definitely. We will do. We'll do. Uh, I'm looking forward to coming to Sierra Leone in person. Uh, I know it's, it's a beautiful country. I want oh, to you love it here. Just like Hopefully. Jamaica. Just like the Caribbean, mm -hmm. you love it here. Oh, okay, it here. okay, okay. Yeah. So, our, right. so our viewers, thank you very much for tuning in today. Um, to everybody, to our executive producer, the head of department of the law department at Private College, Honorable Justice Abu Binet Kamar. And on behalf of my producer, Lady Teresa Solomon, of course, she has torn down the, 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 the living room into a mini studio. Let me, let me take you through um, the studio. Of, of the law society as you can see guys this is our studio this is our studio oh, okay <laughs> yes this is um this is the monitor here as you can see uh look at uh i'm felix here this is felix oh okay uh, look at me over here and then to no, uh... the the computer is here we, we we had to switch the this monitor off because we want to focus on this one this one monitor and then we had a, a ready power pack in case we had electricity um, um, shut out. And then um, this is my living room. It has been turned into a mini studio. Thanks and gratitude to our producer, Lady Solomon. And to everybody out there, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, we will meet again next week. Next week we shall be, um, probably we shall be going north to be one of the, the legal system of uh, sisters countries in the north. Or probably we shall be going south again. Because I've, I've, we've sent two invitations, we've sent one invitation to Egypt, and then to Karim. Do you remember Karim? Remember that Egyptian guy? Yeah, I, I remember. Yeah, I remember Karim. I remember Karim. <laughs> yeah, we, yes. we shall be having Karim probably if he accepts the invitation, oh, or we go uh, to the the the, 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 the the Rainbow Nation of South Africa. Very well. All right. Bye, my brother. Cheers. Thank you very much for joining. Cheers to you too. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.